Morning, everybody. Uh, Thea's right that I'm usually the executive editor and director of communications at The Breakthrough, but today, for one day only, I am also Alex Trembath, um, while the real one is getting married. Um, we will be joined virtually in a, in a few minutes by another of our guests, um, but a point of order before we begin today's sessions, I'll remind you about the Chatham House rule. Um, everything said on stage and on the screens is public, everything else is not, so please keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to open today with Uncertain Catastrophe. Um, the panelists will be David Wallace-Wells from the New York Times, uh, Ted Nordhaus, Breakthrough's own, um, Oliver Morton, and joining us virtually will be T. Jayaraman um, and Juliet Kayam. So please uh, come up on stage and we'll get the first panel underway. Mm. Should have gone last if you have all this stuff down. That, that, that would be, <laughs> yeah, no, but no, that, that, would, that would show planning. And people don't want planning, they want spontaneity and um, all that other good stuff which we will undoubtedly provide in large amounts. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for bringing your energetic selves down um, to this opening session. Um, there used to be a satirical um, TV show on um, British television called Spitting Image, which featured Rabelaisian cartoons of politicians and other public figures. And one of the nice running jokes about it was at the end of the credits and production credits and everything um, in every episode came the line, based on an original lunch with Martin Johnson Nadd. And that was just great, actually. I just completely screwed the guy's name. But the idea based on an original lunch buy. So we thought we'd see if we could go further than that. So this is our first, I think, breakthrough um, uh, plenary session, which is based on an, ori on an original Twitter storm by um, many of the people um, that you will be seeing on our screens and on our panel. Or if you're seeing everything on screens, that makes no sense. Um, you in the room uh, will be seeing them in both forms. Um, this uh, came about when uh, a discussion about the merits and demerits of Kim Stanley Robinson's The Ministry for the Future um, took off last year, I should um, say by way of, um, uh, what do you call it, um, disclosure, that uh, Stanley Robinson is a friend of mine, but that doesn't really matter much, particularly here, but uh, I think you should know it. Um, anyway, uh, so, the, so there was expression of how doomist and climate porny and why does everyone love this book coming from, among other people, um, Ted um, on, the, on the panel. Um, and various people got dragged into this in various different ways, including me um, and including Ezra Klein, who said, why don't you actually have a proper debate about this rather than just sniping at each other on Twitter? Um, and for one of the only times in history, that actually turned out to be a good idea. Um, and, so, well, that seemed a good idea and has seemed a good idea up until now. Whether it remains a good idea, we will only know by about 10.30. Um, at the moment, um, we have uh, one, of our, um, one of our panelists, T.J. Jayaraman, um, is, was always planning to attend by... Um, by, by, by video link. Uh, unfortunately, uh, another of our panelists, Juliet, is also um, due not to uh, insurmountable distance, but just the fact that the airlines are screwed up, um, able to only attend by distance. I'm going to try and make sure that that doesn't matter too much, and I'm sure that they're going to give great brief presentations um, and that they're going to be able to fill in. But it does mean, at the margins, that I'm going to uh, think there's a particular onus on you guys um, to keep the uh, energy up um, as we move into a more general discussion. Um, and I should note, incidentally, that I will, by and large, be taking attention paid to laptops and phones as an indication that you really, really want to speak and will be coming to you in the, in, in, in the questions period. Um, the other thing I wanted to say briefly before the questions period, those of you who have seriously done the homework and read the whole two paragraphs of introduction to this panel, will notice that it is slanted in a particularly and understandably breakthrough-ish way. Um, uh, and if you, didn't, um, uh, if you didn't read that far, I think the, the, the gist of that is cat catastrophism is quite bad, um, and rational discussion of things is, is very good. Um, 
uh, and if you want to move beyond my crude caricature of that, uh, you don't have to, you are the people at the dialogue. You can express any views on how catastrophic or otherwise you feel about these things. You don't have to be good, eco I mean, I'm not quite sure I know what a good eco-modernist is compared to any other eco-modernist. You don't have, there's no party line in the discussions here, despite what the um, f framing might suggest to you. So bring, bring whatever you want to bring when we get on to that bit. Um, but for now, um, are we ready to bring in TJ? Okay, well, um, we're, the order of this is run roughly in the order of the, original, um, of the original contributions to the Twitter thread. So we're going to start off with TJ Jayaraman, um, who is right there. That's terrific. Technology works. <laughs> yeah, now that, that, that was really stupid, wasn't it? That was completely rookie. That's like trying, uh, it's like trying to control the blinds at a solar geoengineering meeting, always guaranteed to, to, to screw things up. Do we now have sound? Yeah, it does look... Yes, we do. <laughs> My work here is done. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the dialogue. Uh, thank you, Breakthrough Institute. Uh, I must speak, uh, you know, even though five minutes is uh, uh, short and valuable, uh, I'm going to spend uh, uh, some few seconds uh, expressing my sense of shock and dismay at the ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court on abortion rights. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, not a good day for progress anywhere in the world. It's not merely a domestic legal issue of the United States. It has uh, huge uh, ramifications. Uh, we will begin to unpack them slowly over time. But uh, it's also good to be reminded that not everything about the world is indeed climate. So uh, that is, unfortunately, a very poor attempt to draw something of a silver lining out of this very dark cloud. So now to the subject at hand. One of the problems with uh, uh, global warming that is perfectly uh, unique to it, especially at this scale, is that it is a global collective action problem. The atmosphere is a global commons. Notwithstanding James Hansen, carbon dioxide is not a toxic substance. Carbon dioxide is both essential to life in the world, but to excess, it becomes a problem. So we have a limited global commons that has to be shared and the only sustainable way that uh, I would argue that it can be shared in a sustainable way is to have a share that is equitable. Unfortunately, this has been very difficult. And uh, despite the United States being the leader in taking uh, ratifying the UNFCC, subsequently has fought shy of the implications of this fact, of this very simple and elementary fact. As a consequence, we are now faced with this extraordinary situation that a country perhaps that is the best equipped scientifically to understand global warming is seen widely across the world as the leading laggard when it comes to taking action. So we have this extraordinary situation of the, uh, the scientific firepower to understand global warming that resides in the United States and derivatively in uh, what is known as the developed world, while at the same time, a sense of desperation driven by the political uh, difficulties of getting global climate action going in these countries. And this sense of desperation 
is leading to this catastrophism. So the casualty in this is something which is intrinsic to science, namely uncertainty. The idea that science delivers certainty is something that has been uh, embraced for all the wrong reasons uh, in uh, the environmentalist discourse, especially in global warming. So somehow we see the future with a sense of deterministic inevitability and uh, are unable to provide room for the fact that a global warming is a problem of anthropogenic origin. And said, so therefore, it depends on human behavior, it depends on human action. <coughs> it could go badly, there is no guarantee that we will succeed. But at the same time, there is uh, no reason to think that it need necessarily end badly. So we are left with this very paradoxical situation that there is a three-way uh, sort of concordance of the most unfortunate kind, the heights of climate denialism, the scientific firepower required to understand global warming, and the brooding sense of catastrophism of the fact that there is nothing we can do to stop the worst from happening all arise from the same society, from the same uh, socio-economic and cultural milieu. So I'll stop here and we can take up other aspects as we go along. Thank you. Thank you very much, TJ, um, and for, for, for that entire presentation, um, including its preamble. Um, Ted. Um, I would say normally that it's lazy to say that someone needs no introduction. Um, Ted is a well-known Twitter troll um, who <laughs> also um, has some sort of, I think it was described to me the other day as a cult um, devoted to um, the worship of the atom somewhere in the Western United States. Ted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's the best introduction I've ever got. <laughs> uh, thank you. So. Um, uh, and thanks, TJ, uh, for starting us off. Um, and as Oliver noted, uh, this, this um, uh, whole panel did sort of start um, with a, uh, what my wife calls a tweet fight. Um, she goes, you're tweet fighting again. Um, but um, there's actually a backstory to that backstory, uh, which is in the spring of 2019, our friend, a mutual friend of many of ours, Paul Robbins at the University of Wisconsin, asked me to come up and help him raise some money uh, at a little fundraising dinner he was doing uh, up in Sonoma. So I kind of went up there, and I didn't know it at the time, but Paul and Kim Stanley Robinson are friends, and Stan was there as well. Uh, and so Paul and Stan and I kind of went out for drinks afterwards, and Stan and I got in an argument. Um, and uh, it was an argument that kind of spilled over uh, kind of for a few days on with some long emails back and forth, at the end of which he said, You've changed the book, thank you very much. Um, and first of all, I didn't think very much of it because I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, so then fast forward to after the book came out a couple months later and someone said, hey, I just heard him on this podcast where he said the entire book was an answer to the eco-modernists. Um, so um, at which point, uh, you know, and the book has gotten um, sort of rave reviews, almost kind of like, like there's like, almost no bad reviews of this book. It's just been sort of unanimously praised as this sort of audacious and original work of uh, fictive imagination. Um, so I said, all right, fine, all right, I gotta sit down and I gotta read the book. Um, and so I sat down and I started reading the book. Um, and the first thing that surprised me was that it is just terrible. And, and I say that not because I disagree with a bunch of the arguments and things that he says. In the, it's just terrible as a work of literature. I mean, it, the characters are two-dimensional. Uh, it's got these um, sort of long sections in the middle of them that it's like the one thing that David Roberts and I have ever agreed on. He called them PDFs. He's like, why do I need to read these PDFs in the middle of the book where he kind of goes off on like these long, just there's not, it's not in the voice of a character or anything. It's just, I'm going to tell you about what a social discount rate is, or now I will explain the carbon cycle to you. Um, 
It's a little bit like, uh, you know, in Moby Dick, Melville, there's these long sections about the whale. Um, but the long sections about the whale in, Mel in, in Moby Dick, they serve a literary purpose, which is really actually to show sort of the total obsession with the whale. Um, but there is no such irony uh, or self-awareness um, in this book. Um, so, um, and besides its um, sort of uh, whatever you think of its liter literary merits, I think it is fair to say that it's really just a con collection of very conventional environmental uh, tropes, some of which are sort of integral to the plot and, and some of which are, are the PDFs. Um, so I stand before you today um, not to praise Ministry for the Future, but to bury it. Um, <laughs> And um, I do that not because I thought it was a crap book, but because I think it sort of perfectly encapsulates sort of everything that is wrong with the contemporary climate discourse. Um, uh, it's, like, it's just like an encyclopedia of terrible green ideas. Um, so um, I want to um, sort of use uh, my time here as um, sort of a... We have a minute left. <laughs> okay, I'm going to beg a little forbearance. Um, to, um, <laughs> because it's important that we should all get the benefits of your literary criticism. Yeah, yeah. True. <laughs> it's it's yes. really what people come here for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, the criticism is done uh, of that part. Um, so I want to use it as a sort of a teachable moment of sorts. Uh, and I really want to kind of hit on three things. The first is, you know, what are the actual risks associated with climate change? How apocalyptic are they? Uh, second, um, what are the apocalyptic framings in service of? Um, and then third, um, if, and I may just kind of get to this in the discussion just to cut, save some time, but just what the non-apocalyptic case uh, for climate action is. So let's start with the risks. I mean, Ministry for the Future, it opens with a wet bulb event um, on the Indian subcontinent in which 20 million people die in like a couple of days. Um, and this is happening not in the far future. It happens in 2025, where temperatures hit 42 degrees Celsius with 60 degrees uh, humidity. And that combination is not accidental. You kind of put that in your little wet bulb calculator. Um, and of course, it adds up to 35 degrees Celsius wet bulb temperature, which is the temperature in which we're all supposed to die. Um, so you know, here's this future, this near future. Um, and uh, we have actually some data points to check that up uh, with. Um, the first, as we've talked about in various points here, I mean, we just had um, a sort of massive heat wave uh, across the Indian subcontinent. Um, uh, you know, preliminary indications suggest about 100 people died. Um, uh, that's probably massively understates the actual uh, mortality, um, but um, not so massively that, like, you know, it's 90 or 100 deaths uh, so far, not 20 million. Um, and if, we kn if it was really anything approaching that, we would know, irrespective of anyone sort of hiding the data. Um, secondly, um, uh, you know, heat mortality, as we talked about in the heat, it's falling. It's been falling. It's falling dramatically uh, all over the world, including uh, across uh, India for many uh, decades. Um, uh, and third, if you actually go and like look at the literature on when temperatures on the Indian subcontinent might sort of approach these wet bulb temperatures, even under RCP 8.5 at the end of this century, that would be a, maybe a four times in a, in a century uh, event. And that's not 20 million people, that's just the dying, that's the temperatures. Um, uh, that assumes that nobody still, you know, we don't know if everyone will have air conditioning or various other ways that you might manage uh, those sorts of temperatures. And we also know that RCP 8.5 in these very far five, six degrees of warming at the end of the century is not um, particularly likely um, uh, or, or plausible at this point. Um, so now we could excuse all of this as sort of, okay, but this is the low probability, the sting is in the tail, this is the tail of the distribution, except that our friend Stan Robinson insists that this is a best case scenario. Um, we could also excuse it because we're like, well, this is one of many kind of climate risks, and you put it all together, it could be really, 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 really terrible. Um, but it is worth noting that heat waves and the mortality associated with them are sort of one of the most direct and predictable uh, consequences, uh, one of the ways that you can kind of go get a big body count out of 
future uh, warming, uh, which is why in recent years we spent so much time talking about it. Um, so second, um, and I'll hold my third point till, till the end so we can get on with the conversation. Um, I just want to raise the question of what these apocalyptic framings are really in service of. And again, I think the book is quite illustrative if you kind of spend a little time thinking about what he is doing here. Um, and so I think it's worth looking at both the solutions that he articulates in this book and then essentially the theory of change. Um, so the solutions, what are they? Um, dirigibles. For those of you who don't know what dirigibles is, they're blimps. So we will travel around the world, not in jet aircraft, um, but in very slow moving, like, like Hindenburg-like things where we'll kind of go across the ocean over a course of weeks. Sailboats also, uh, no more freight, no more, you know, uh, kind of motors. Uh, it's just like sailboats going to kind of take us and our freight and everything across the ocean. Large scale organic regenerative agriculture. Um, and all coal in, uh, in India uh, very rapidly gets replaced with solar. Um, not clear how all the air conditioning they're going to need operates at, light, at, at night with all this solar. Um, uh, but that's, that's, that's the book. Um, uh, and then, uh, yes, we actually get solar geoengineering, but it's not like aerosols up in the sky. It's this like Rube Goldberg kind of low tech. We're going to kind of pipe the water out from under the under the glaciers and, and put it on top of the glaciers. The glaciers will stop sliding. Um, and what's you know, interesting, this is his real answer to eco-modernism. It's low tech, it's naturalistic, and it is also wildly improbable. Uh, the remedy, this remedy would be far worse than the ailment. Um, attempting to do so at any significant scale would virtually assure societal collapse. Um, and so then that brings us to the second thing, and, and I'll end on this. Uh, which is, what is the theory of... the second thing. I'm sorry, Ted. Uh, <laughs> what is the theory of change? Um, and um, uh, how does the world kind of tackle climate change and kind of solve this sort of politics? Everyone's like, well, it deals with... It, finally, someone really deals with the politics of solving climate change. Well, one, eco-terrorism. Um, eco-terrorists start shooting down airplanes and assassinating corporate CEOs. Secondly... The actual ministry of the future is this new UN agency. Um, and um, the agency, um, you know, in its formal capacity, at least from the book, what it appears that people do, the agency does is they sit around and talk about how bad the climate science is. But apparently it is also running black ops on the side where it is blowing up fossil fuel infrastructure. And finally, the sort of third um, sort of horsemen of saving the world from apocalypse are central bankers um, who introduced a Bitcoin-like currency for carbon removal, um, which sort of incentivized everyone to kind of go do the carbon removal and remove the carbon uh, from the sky. So what do all these things have in common? Um, well, I would argue, at best, a tenuous relationship to any sort of democratic accountability. And literally, there is sort of no democratic institutions or practice that play any role in this book. There is no civil society. There's not even any protest. Um, so you put these things together, and what do you get? You get an improbable apocalyptic fantasy in service of naturalistic solutions um, that can't work, rendered in this sort of sciencey sort of precision that a lot of science fiction does where they sort of show you how technically uh, kind of proficient they are. Um, and tied, I think most importantly, uh, to an implicit threat, which is do what we say or stronger measures will be necessary. So on that note, I will end my remarks and I look forward to hearing from the rest of the panel. Thank you. Given your commitment to achieving disagreement, I'd hate to see what you'd want to do if you were going the other way. Um, our next speaker is David Wallace Wells, who's one of the um, best known American uh, journalists who concentrates on the climate and other issues in the atmosphere. If you didn't see it, his piece in the LRB on air pollution was absolutely spectacular. Um, he's probably most famous for the uninhabitable Earth, which grew out of a piece um, that he wrote for New York Magazine, which I 
think was some, set some sort of record for something, um, and a, a, a good one, you know, sort of like lots of people. Um, and so, David, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I feel like I'm sort of playing the, if Katie was playing the role of Alex, I'm playing the role of um, Kim, or Stan, right? I don't know him, so. Um, um, wishing that he was here on the panel to respond. I do know that he has said recently that he, um, he wishes that he hadn't included um, the crypto solution, which is um, an interesting public revision. Um, I, um, I don't want to defend that book or Stan um, or his worldview. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, what I would describe as my own quasi-catastrophic view of the near future and why I hold that view. Um, you know, this, pa this panel is called Uncertain Catastrophe. I don't think that catastrophe is certain. I think that it is uncertain, but I think that, that uncertainty is quite scary. And a lot of the impacts that we know are going to be coming are, you know, do represent quite large obstacles to human flourishing, indeed the functioning of um, democratic societies in parts of the world, I would say. Um, Maybe that's a dubious claim, but the, the challenges are there. They are real. They are growing. Um, and what sort of future we design for ourselves on that landscape is an open question. But that uncertainty for me is not an argument for complacency. It's an argument for action. And I see um, anyone who's looking at the science and growing alarmed, as I did a few years ago, as um, waking up to that set of facts. So with the caveat that this may be incredibly um, elementary for all of you. I just want to start at a very basic baseline of like, there is more carbon in the atmosphere now than there has been for many hundreds of thousands of years. Um, we know that global temperatures are really closely correlated with that fact. Um, it is today warmer than it has been for the history of human civilization, which means that everything that we have known as a species, as a thinking species, is the result of climate conditions that have already been left behind. And we can see the scale of that transformation even today at one point, depending on who you ask, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 degrees, um, almost everywhere you look in the, in the weather. Now, of course, there's weather variability. Um, natural disasters long predate the, the phenomenon of climate change. But we are now regularly seeing you know, things that are described as multi-million year events taking place in the world today. Um, five 500 year storms in Houston in five years, which is, you know, if you take that term seriously, which we shouldn't anymore, but if you do, it means literally millennia of extreme weather compressed into half a decade um, concentrated in, in one city. Um, these are, even in the wealthy, well-prepared parts of the world, they are challenges. They, are, they can be lethal challenges, and they impose suffering in many sublethal ways, too, which is something I wanted to pick up on maybe in the discussion later, that when we talk about heat impacts in particular, but other impacts as well, it's not just the most extreme things that we have to worry about. This is a spectrum of suffering. People die well below 35C, wet bulb temperatures, and if we can take action to limit that suffering and limit that death, that's very much for the good. Um, now, it's important to keep in mind, you think, um, you know, Houston, five, 500 year storms in five years, Houston's still standing. There are millions of people living there. Most of them are um, understanding their lives as um, normal, um, even if they are also being affected in various ways by the climate changes. And I do think it's important, um, not just because we're here um, as part of a breakthrough dialogue, but in general to understand that climate impacts um, represent only half of the story here. And human response, human adaptation, human resilience um, is the other half. And we don't really know yet how those things will go together. Um, we don't know what vulnerability, what human vulnerabilities climate impacts will reveal beyond the direct um, devastation and suffering they impose. Um, but I think very important to keep in mind, personally for me, and I think it's been a theme throughout um, this whole conference, is that the only standard, um, the standard to apply in judging the state of the present, the health of the present, the viability of the future, um, and how much optimism we should have about it or how much catastrophism we should have about it is not simply whether in aggregate things are inching forward and making a slightly better world. The past is not the only standard with which we can judge the present or the future and we have to apply um, 
we have to understand that there are many other counterfactuals unfolding already and certainly unfolding into the future and do what we can to move ourselves as close to our optimal future as we possibly can. So thinking about, you know, even asking the question like um, about catastrophism sets the baseline at apocalypse in a way that I think is actually quite unhelpful. Um, but measuring from a baseline of an optimal future we might have imagined or could imagine today if the world took um, really dramatic action, I think we're falling well short of that. We will be imposing considerably more suffering, especially in the global south, um, sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia in particular. Um, those places are not going to be literally uninhabitable by climate change on timescales that we should be making policy choices on, but life will suffer um, and be much more difficult as a result of many of these changes. And whatever we can do to bring ourselves up off of um, that, you know, line of failure and towards a line of an optimal future, I think is um, worth doing and is a, the, the gap between those two things is genuinely at the moment, given where we are, I think cause for alarm. And that's why I am alarmed about it and want to talk about how bad things could be and how much better they could be if we'd made different choices. Thank you very much indeed, David. Um, the last speaker is Juliet, who is the author of this um, very handsome book. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good design. Thank you. Um, and um, is, uh, is Professor of International Security Studies um, at the Harvard Kennedy School, um, I think the Belfort Professor, and sits on the boards of many people who are important. Um, and. Uh, less um, concerned directly with climate issues and more, as the, book, as the book's title shows, with the question of how people respond to disasters and stresses um, which uh, come at them unawares. Um, Juliet. I mean, one of those stresses included attempts to get there, so I'm very sorry. I uh, uh, seven hours later, I, I, I uh, uh, seven hours later in the air in Boston, so I apologize for not um, and really grateful to uh, and and thrilled to know David, whose work I read and and learn, from, um, if only because I ended talking about human agency. In fact, to to talk about catastrophe and disaster as that we can measure the the sort of off humans going to do is where my work and where I think uh, uh, what I write about, but also disaster management world is. That's the world I'm in. The world. Uh, call right side of the boom so you know the boom is and cyber attack but in this case disaster left side of the is considered all the things that a lot of going on in terms of mitigation and stopping that bad thing from and then there's people like me think about what happens at that moment how can we uh for success based on agency and sometimes it's helpful for where the words disaster and come from uh uh, 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 when we talk about an agency disaster, this, uh, which is not, or an aster, which is of ours, right? And so it, it's a sense in the past was that disaster random and rare, uh, and uh, there was no human agency. That's how you measure disasters was, was because of a, or described disasters was because of a misalignment. Catastrophe changed that same language, right? So it's a, there is no way for uh, 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 to give certainty, uncertainty, just to go back to the of this session. So what I as a certain, and the title is The Devil Never Sleeps, that I actually, after 20 years, I'm giving up on, uh, I'm giving up is a little strong, uh, risk calculations to me less than figuring out what can we learn from high consequence events. My standard of success on the, the boom is can be things be made Bad. And it's a good standard of because I can't make things good right now. And so where the field is in terms of homeland disaster management, uh, trying to find the commonalities of all of these disasters, in particular climate disasters, to see can I do success on whether moment of the boom I can mitigate so that you know this means then I tend to sometimes speak rather crudely, you know, a thousand dead worse than 100 dead, right? And there's no way 100 dead is a good thing. But when you're measuring 
have I invested in these to, uh, to, to mitigate that moment of, especially climate booms, a lot we can learn. And unfortunately, climate has given us a lot of examples. So shorthand is we're learning learn to fail safer. I don't talk about, uh, that word does not come out of my, because th I just don't, that world. I mean, it just is sort of a silly goal to get to. And resiliency is makes love it. And I love the idea of this few but stronger and, and, and better ad ad adaptive. I'm just we, between between and then we've got a lot of things that we can So three quick examples of what a world from climate um, disasters. Uh, so obviously just an investment in earth systems can go far in terms of protecting populations uh, early for that is um, obviously soon warnings whether they're stronger because of climate uh, but also in the midst of all the mad politics right now uh, it's had a, a terrific story to, in, in the way these things are um surfside which is a major condo in Florida uh that went uh that collapsed buildings don't just collapse this is a building that could contain the changes that were with the climate in Florida uh there was an early alert system uh, the guard did not use it. Seven minutes does a lot to save people's time. You can a minute and you can do a lot to save uh, lives. Uh, and so the alert systems, uh, second, uh, uh, what we call stupid be mitigated, stupid deaths or the uh, uh, because uh, not because of the incident itself, because of cascading. Uh, this, uh, this is particularly true things. In the United States now, most people do not die from hurricanes die from water, they do not die from flooding, they die from carbon monoxide because resources aren't delivered, people put out their generators, generators aren't functioning or they're not working right, um, and they die from carbon monoxide. But I know that as a disaster planner, I can begin to the harms of these overwhelming hurt by both training on generators. Uh, uh, those in country know they we do this uh, but also trying to search the resources. Uh, for, so that's another lesson learned. Can learn to fail safer. That's because I'm running out of time. Is better engagement with communities to protect in that moment of need. My book is a historical book about disasters and rethink them in terms of what worked because we never stories of what worked. Hurricanes is the best example for this. It overwhelmed government resources. We tend to think of it as a good response. One of the reasons is uh, by an effort called Occupy Sandy. Occupy Sandy was actually Occupy Wall Street reformed. All those people who we tended to think of as just protesters in tents and what's the point, uh, they have to leave Wall Street uh, uh, as Hurricane Sandy on board. It turns out uh, they have iPads, they're younger, they're bilingual, and they know their communities. Uh, the best um, adaptation FEMA uh, was to change their name. It's you can read about it by Sandy, and they went out to places that aren't often represented at the t uh, and got information and resources delivered. That's why uh, we think of the Hurricane Sandy was relatively successful, less bad, as I say. So those are just some of the lessons we're beginning to learn. Um, except uh, that uh, that success is just less bad at the. Um, so that's sort of where it is. Thank you very much, Juliet. Um, I'm going to ask, can we try and get Juliet on a better line for the... Uh, no, we can't. Sorry? They're working on it. They're working on Audio? it. Great. Okay. Um, so that... So, um, but I think we got... I certainly got, I think, uh, much of your message, and um, I'm sure that we'll be able to bring, bring out more of it in the, uh, in, in the Q&A. So in, in, in terms of uncertainty, um, which we're, we're meant to be looking at. We now have 30 years of thinking about the climate um, in, in this context of anthropogenic change and danger. And I thought it'd be a useful um, clearing um, opportunity to find out um, from the panelists what they used to believe that they now do not in this subject. What have you, basically, what have you been wrong about? Because when we think about uncertainty, one of the things that we're trying to avoid is 
as uh, Ted was bringing out, is misplaced certainty, um, whatever that misplaced certainty is. Um, and so I'd be very interested in hearing. Um, I think we should probably go um, in order that people originally spoke. What were you wrong about, either about climate or climate response, in a way that you consider genuinely consequential? You thought something, and it turned out the world didn't work out that way. So, TJ. Uh, I think uh, uh, it does sound uh, a bit arrogant, but uh, I will up and say it, that uh, I am very unsurprised. Uh, possibly because I have been in climate, uh, very actively dealing with climate issues and climate policy only for uh, the last 12 to 13 years. So that accounts perhaps for the fact that not that much has changed. But uh, I have a sense of the history because it uh, was part of uh, the task I set myself to see how this thing evolved. And uh, we could have predicted we got here. Uh, and I think in uh, India, amongst uh, some of us climate analysts, uh, that's, uh, you know, we were always sure this would happen. So let me give you an example. When Paris was being signed, uh, two of my colleagues from India and myself, uh, we issued a press statement saying that uh, at the rate of current emissions, the, uh, this thing, the uh, carbon budget is going to be very rapidly exhausted. And by the 20s or 30s, you know, the numbers shifted a bit. Uh, that uh, we would be reaching 1.5. At that time, because of the fifth assessment report of IPCC was the only thing av available, and carbon budgets were not central to the story at that time, uh, we were simply not listened to. People said, uh, you know, we just it was like uh, throwing a stone down a bottomless well. But uh, right now, it is up there in the Glasgow Climate Pact, as they call it, that the remaining carbon budget is very limited and that's going to be the real crunch that we are going to face. So I think, uh, uh, like I, uh, my own point of view on this is that the fault lines have been clear for a very long time. Uh, right from the beginning, from the uh, the way the uh, various countries reacted in the first five to seven or even ten years after the UNFCC was signed, the fault lines of today are clear. They are being reproduced. The global situation outside of climate, the general air, uh, has considerably deteriorated in terms of cooperation. If you look at the UNFCC and you look at the Paris Agreement, the way it deals with issues of equity and the fact that there is underdevelopment in uh, lack of development in large parts of the world, the contrast is striking. Paris Agreement accepts no differentiation. It doesn't talk of those who have greater responsibility in any serious way. So we have been ethically in retreat and uh, the consequences uh, are clear. So uh, you would pardon me if I say uh, we are unsurprised by where we find ourselves. But I just like to. No, actually, uh, I, I, I'd, like, I'd like to come in a little quick because I do, do want to get to the others. But given your. Um, excellent track record, where then do you expect to be in 30 years' time? In 30 years' time, uh, I think uh, we are, uh, the saving grace is that the impacts are not going to be as severe as we fear. Let me give a simple example. Uh, and this, uh, I, it really struck me when uh, David was talking about his point of view, which of course I'm sure he has good reasons for. Take agriculture. 
We are already in terms of surface land temperatures at 1.1 out of 1.5. The carbon dioxide is unprecedented. The, uh, the world is climatologically in certain parameters unprecedented in character. But I think the Ukraine war is a much more serious question for global food security than the climate. The world has not collapsed. It, you know, the numbers may be off a little, but, uh, you know, Indians were not keeling over uh, along with little birds in the streets of Delhi or uh, Agra. And uh, I have a thing or two to say about the wet bulb prediction for the future as you see it. But unfortunately, even in the IPCC, we found a reluctance to confront this simple fact. So the IPCC's working group too does not acknowledge that technical advance in agriculture has kept a global food production and productivity, generally speaking, overall, not everywhere, uh, not all crops, etc., but overall has kept it go rising. So I think we are going to be able to find ways to manage impact. There is certainly the possibility that if we do not, that worse things are in store. But I think that this is where, to me, uncertainty is critical. Okay. We still. Thanks very, thanks very much. Thanks very much, DJ. Ted, what have you been wrong about? Uh, a lot. Um, so, you know, I mean, I spent the first half of my career as an activist, as an organizer, with a pretty kind of standard view of climate change and climate risk. Okay, I think I'm going to stop you right there. I think we know the sort of like death of environmentalism story. What no, no, I'm, I'm going to tell you three things okay. that, have, that I've changed my mind uh, about over the years. The first is, um, uh, you know, as I... and. Per my remarks, uh, you know, I used to have a much more uh, kind of um, existential view of climate risk. <laughs> and every time I try to learn more and I dig in and I look at kind of, well, how does this actually work? What are the mechanisms where like society collapses, where we get millions and millions of deaths from climate change? It gets really, re I, I, I just become much more skeptical of these narratives. Um, secondly, uh, as everyone here knows, you know, I uh, once upon a time thought you could kind of run the world on renewable energy entirely. I don't believe that's the case anymore. Um, and third, um, you know, I think that um, like a lot of people, I tended when I thought about fossil fuels and getting rid of them to focus on the things that we all are most uh, kind of aware of, which is electricity, maybe light duty vehicles. And I think over the years I've come to appreciate all the other things that we do with fossil fuels, fertilizer, industrial uses, all sorts of refining, all sorts of things that are actually sort of a really different animal if you're trying to kind of get off fossil fuels and are really, really central to human well-being and um, sort of modern sort of techno society. Um, so uh, those are the three things. And again, I've what does having been so very wrong about those things make you think about the future? Given, given your poor track record to date? Um, <laughs> I, I, um, I, I think that um, all predictions about the future will be wrong and some of them will be useful. Um, no, that, uh, I was asking about, you know, what, what do you think about in your current worldview? When you think about the person who believed those wrong things, when you look at yourself honestly today, what do you worry about that your worldview may be missing? I mean, I mean honestly, I look, look I, I spent the night on, on uh, Tuesday night sleeping on my deck because it was too hard, hot to sleep inside my air-conditioned house. Um, I uh, just watched, um, you know, uh, my uh, family ranch has been in my family for over 100 years, was at ground zero of the big New Mexico fire. Um, uh, so you kind of look at that and it's not that hard to kind of go, oh my God, it's all right and the world is going to catch fire and whatever I can sort of say statistically or all the holes I kind of increasingly see in a bunch of these arguments, it's just going to be wrong and it's going to be really bad and I'm going to kind of regret ever having thought that, you know, any of this could end well. Um, so um, yeah, I could be wrong, absolutely be wrong about all of that and I think we all have a responsibility 
um, to kind of look at these things and kind of go, like, how does that work? How do we get from here to there? So that's always the tension. And it's always the tension, I think, as, um, uh, you know, as kind of late moderns. Um, I think we are quite, um, for a bunch of reasons, um, sort of uniquely positioned to kind of see uh, the looming end of the world in all sorts of ways. Um, and so, you know, I think we have to strike a balance between talking back to a bunch of that apocalypsism That's okay. and I, taking I was, the I, risk I, seriously. I, I, I was good with, with, with just that very honest approach of what, 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 you, what you worry about. David. Um, well, I've mentioned a couple of things moving in a couple of different directions that I was wrong about at a couple of different points in my life. So when I first started really thinking about climate, the thing that most shocked me and upended my worldview was how fast um, the climate was changing, how fast the carbon emissions were accumulating in the atmosphere. You know, that half of all emissions that we've produced from the burning of fossil fuels have come in the last 25, 30 years. That was really shocking to me. Um, it's more recently been um, sort of upending to realize that the temperature targets that are being set by the global climate community and embraced by nearly every leader, um, political and corporate, um, the, the goal of approaching 1.5 degrees is, is a really, really, um, we're not going to get there. Um, the, you know, the, the, the slightly higher target of two degrees, I think, is in some conceivable way maybe in play, but takes an enormous amount. And I personally, I'm skeptical that we'll stay below two. But the, the stated goal of the world's um, climate community and to some degree the geopolitical community um, more broadly, I think, is implausible. And I think that's a really complicated and um, disorienting thing to wrap your head around. Um, and that is, means that we'll be at a level of warming that scientists at least um, have often warned us about. I mean, two degrees has been the level that we've been trying to avoid um, and will bring a lot of the scary impacts that you know, we all know about and, and um, Ted has been talking about and, and BJ has been talking about as, um, as TJ has been talking about as um, less worrying than we've been told, but we've been told about them a lot. Um, that happens at two degrees. Um, in the other direction, um, I've been struck I think the most dramatic change in the global, you know, on the global stage, climate-wise, over the last few years, is just how dramatically um, the price of renewables has fallen, and how quickly, as a result, um, um, expectations for the future in the world's energy community have changed. Um, now, the, they are, those new models, those new projections, may have flaws in them. They may be, um, you know. Pollyannish about some things that we need to be worrying about more, but they present a radically different picture than those same people were projecting just a few years ago. And, um, you know, it's, that's just another layer of uncertainty that's folded into all of this. They're the, the, the climate uncertainty, the human uncertainty, the energy uncertainty. The, there's a whole lot of uncertainties layer on top of one another. And the thing that I've personally um, moved on, I wouldn't say I, it's quite um, something I feel like I've been wrong about, but it's something that I've thought a lot about since I published my book especially is the point I made in my opening remarks, which is that, you know, these climate impacts can seem total and overwhelming because they are quite large and imposing and threatening. Um, but there is also the human response story that um, will be unfolding as well. And we need to try to keep both of those things in mind, not assume, especially um, some lower levels of warming that we now expect um, than we might have feared a few years ago not assume that the climate impacts are going to be um, all determinative, um, but merely shaping the landscape on which we will be building our future. It may be a, a relatively less hospitable landscape, a relatively more hospitable landscape, but it is just the landscape and we have to figure out ways to live on it. And I think that that's, um, that's been a major shift in my own thinking over the last few years. And Juliet. Yeah, so how's that audio now? We took out the, the other piece. You guys can hear me better? Much. Okay, sorry about that. That must have been some more. Um, so I think two things that I uh, think about or have changed. I, mean, I started my career in counterterrorism and sort of you know trying to stop bad things from happening and, and had a very tremendous, you know, big change in Homeland Security after Hurricane Katrina. Most of us in the field ended up being sort of all hazards focused. And I think I'd much, uh, in terms of the changes, is that uh, a little bit of what I talked about in the introduction, which is that that uh, uh, we are at a stage where measuring success uh, really does 
have to be measured in sort of, you know, the, the bad thing is going to happen. And can we invest the resources, not just the resiliency, but the resources at that moment um, to, to, to fail safer? I, I, that's a big change in terms of uh, climate, just because I just think, you know, mitigation is too slow. We do have agency to stop it, but we're going to have a lot of years in which, not a lot of years, a lot of decades and possibly centuries in which we're just managing disasters and we'll get better at it uh, with each one. The second one where I've totally changed on policy is, at least in the U.S., but most countries are like this, is, is in disaster relief uh, for climate events. We have a structure in the United States under the Stafford Act uh, which um, basically pays people to, because we feel bad for them that they live near oceans or in fire areas and, um, and, uh, and congressmen demand it where, uh, where we're distributing public funds uh, to essentially uh, not have people behave better or recognize the changing earth. I would get, I mean, to be revolutionary, I would get rid of the Stafford Act at this stage. It was based on a notion of climate disasters as being random and rare. They are just not. And then what you want to do now is just drive disaster resources to, to either paying people to move, to manage retreat, uh, to, to requirements of what, where they can rebuild. Uh, we are just way too um, acquiescent to the sorrowful demands of those who are victims of uh, or survivors of climate disasters, and then it's just a, it's just a waste of resources at this stage. So that would be my my if if I ran the world, I would get rid of how we we do all of disaster relief now in light of of the changes that were the 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 the, the continuous nature of disasters now. I think that's a very strong answer. I um, I would like to actually now I think go a little bit earlier to the. Um, audience, because you guys have been, been here for a while, you've been listening to this, um, and I'd like to hear a few points from you. Do we have some Mikey type people? Um, yeah, Mikey type people, there we go. Um, up here, and then over there. Hi, uh, Ramez Nam. Uh, I'd like to address my comments primarily to Ted, but to the, the whole panel. Uh, so just for context, I'm a climate optimist in the sense that I don't think the world is likely to end. I think we're likely to stop warming on the current path uh, somewhere in the low twos, between somewhere between two and 2.5, probably not two, but somewhere over there. I think uh, human adaptability is underrated. Uh, but I also heard in your comments, Ted, a, a unwarranted certainty about things. Because when I think about these things, I recognize that at the level of emissions, the climate models with a central estimate of 2.2 or 2.3 degrees, there's a spread. There's a bell curve of those that could be 3.1 or 3.2. And one thing that I was wrong about when I wrote my first book on this is I expected uh, much more in climate uh, rapid feedback loops, and now I'm less concerned about them, it's certainly at two, but at three, you start to get real risk of those, and we have a risk of, of running out of control of some of those. And then I'd, I'd add a couple more things. One, in defense of Stan, who's also a friend of mine, <laughs> the goal of fiction sometimes is to shock us and to exaggerate. And a wet bulb event that kills 20 million people in 2025 is exaggeration. Like, that's, it, that's almost implausible. But Chennai experienced a wet bulb temperature of 31C. Uh, 35C is the level at which everybody dies if they're out for six hours, even in the shade with a fan not moving. The National Weather Service says 31C is where you run real risk, people that are elderly or have health problems. 32C, it gets higher than that. 33C, it gets uh, extremely dangerous, is what the National Weather Service says. And it's plausible with one additional degree Celsius of warming in an extreme event, you could see that. Chennai is a population of 11 million people. So you could start to see hundreds of thousands of deaths or a million deaths by the 2040s. That's not at all implausible. Second, there's other things that I worry about. Uh, all coral reefs, we have had the belief for a while that at two degrees Celsius, all coral reefs would experience uh, bleaching events, something we basically didn't know about 20 years ago, faster than they could recover. And without some strong intervention, uh, they would pass away. The most recent papers with higher resolution models says that 1.5 degrees C, which we will hit in the 2030s, no doubt about that, unless we do solar radiation management, we will hit 1.5 degrees C in the 2030s, 
At that temperature, all shallow water coral reefs, the first 100 meters or so, will start to experience bleaching events more rapidly than they can recover and will go into terminal decline. 800 million people depend upon that for, depend upon fish that are raised on coral reefs for protein. Uh, third, there's ripple effects. There are negative effects. The war, uh, Sudan and Darfur, was a resource war. Not sure I can call it a climate war. Maybe climate played a part. But that resource stress uh, led to three million people dying. It started a wave of migration into Europe that probably drove Europe's politics far more conservative. Uh, so there's a lot of ripple effects. I think as you get to, you, know, you go from carbon dioxide to temperature, you have uncertainties there. You go from temperature to ecological response, you have bigger uncertainties there. You go from ecological response to human societal response, you have deeper uncertainties there. So I believe we'll turn it around, even at 2.5 degrees C. Yeah. But I also see like real risk in all those scenarios as well. Thank you, Ross. Yeah, so thanks. Uh, works of fiction are designed to encourage thought and possibly action. And um, personally, I, I hope that, that Kim designed this book uh, to get people to think. Because when I read it, I thought this book addresses a fundamental human need, which is certainty. Um, unfortunately, the outcome of the certainty that the book delivers is essentially stasis and regression, and, and probably a lot more suffering than they realistically portray in yeah. the book. Now. Um, I guess my response is that having worked in R&D and development and whatever for a long time, uh, there's kind of this Yoda philosophy to making shit happen. And it's either you do or do not. There is no try. And, and this book actually is completely vacant on that topic. That essentially it, it creates a certain future um, by doing certain things that people can do now. It's the typical stop type of response or take a violent act type of response. And I'm curious what you think about how you would blend uh, the uncertainty that is necessary in advancing technology, politics, et cetera, because uncertainty is distinctly uncomfortable for a lot of people. Yeah. But you need to go through the uncertainty and the scientific risk in order to get to the other side. I kind of wanted to come back to you on that. Uh, what would you like to ask who specifically in that question? Sorry, my ask should have been more specific. So uh, I guess um, the panelists have responded about their thoughts on where things are uh, and where their own beliefs have shifted. So I'm asking, based on how your beliefs have shifted, what do you think is a reasonable course of actions to take that address the, the human type of thing that this book is talking about? How do you get people uncomfortable with uncertainty? Hmm. You mean comfortable with uncertainty? Yeah, because I, I think getting people uncomfortable with uncertainty is part of, part, part of the difficulty. Um, I'd like, I think that's a very good question. I mean, but do you want to people to be comfortable with uncertainty? Is uncertainty one of the drivers of change, or is it an obstacle in change? Um, and I think you can read that either way. Ted, you were particularly singled out for unwarranted certainty. Um, how do you feel that, about that question of losses, about how you deal with the fundamental uncertainties? I mean, I guess my view, and I'll, I'll, I'll use it to answer both questions, um, which is, um, uh, you know, how do you kind of pursue a course, policies, a politics, whatever, that is robust to all of this uncertainty, uh, both in terms of kind of how exactly climate change with higher temperatures is going to unfold, um, and, um, uh, and sort of what the various uh, kind of pathways are um, to mitigate it and adapt to it. Um, and so, like, uh, uh, you know, my view is that, like, you know, we should be, you know, and this is the part I didn't get to in my talk, but, like, I do think there's a strong, that, that, that there's a stronger case for action in non-apocalyptic, non-catastrophist terms than there is this idea that if we scare everybody straight, yeah. the scales will fall from their eyes and suddenly we will go remake yeah, the world absolutely. very quickly. And that's I think right. that's just a f absolutely failed, um, there, the, the, there's just no evidence that this works and lots of evidence that it's actually really counterproductive. Um, 
So you kind of go, well, let's just kind of look at the direction of travel. Let's look at the things that are kind of moving in the right direction. Let's try to learn from them and see how we got to move faster in that direction without necessarily trying to posit a, a, a destination. And believe me, the reason um, that we focus on like 1.5 or 2 or these, you know, frankly, they're just phony numbers. They're made up. There's actually no actual science behind them in the sense that some bad things happen after it or not before it, it's just literally these are political conventions, um, is to kind of try to kind of construct a kind of certainty in a discourse around the destination. And then we start talking about things like carbon budgets and what you can do inside the budget or not inside the budget. And it's just a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a simulacrum um, where um, we talk about uh, these things as if they're real. They're not real. In the meantime, we're kind of in the world and there's like, progress and there's not progress and I think we would be so much better off if we could figure out how to kind of get beyond this debate that for a bunch of reasons was kind of constructed like 30 years ago has utterly failed and just kind of go like okay how do we keep hundreds of thousands of people from dying in Chennai at 31C? Um, well, first of all, the biggest knob for we, ha we have for that that we could actually turn today is not mitigation, it's adaptation. It's like creating the infrastructure, the technology, um, the sort of societal levels of wealth that allow for people to actually have um, sort of some sanctuary under those conditions. Yeah. I'm trying to. It's true. If I could yeah. just say, I mean, I'm sorry. So, I mean, just I'm, be very quick. We're just sort of picking up on that point. So, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, response or or, or uh, mechanisms or disaster management, the, the least successful way to deal with it is to talk in a way, uh, which a lot of these reports do, that would make the average person who isn't in a room on climate. Uh, either give them only two options, tune out or freak out, right? If those are your only two options, you're not going to assert agency. You're going to do one or the other. And I think it's really important in terms of the discourse to, to not, to, I mean, if your ultimate goal is, right, you want mitigation, you want more resiliency, it cannot be that an effective strategy is, uh, you know, tune out a freak out. You've got to give people agency, even if it's agency at the moment the bad thing happens, because uh, people people tend to want to mi want to minimize the harm to themselves and, and, and their homes. Juliet, who do you see as minimizing agency here? Where do you see that? Do, so that I, I mean, I'll tell you as a as a consumer. I'm this, I'm not an I'm a consumer of intelligence. I read health intelligence. I read climate intelligence. I read a lot of these reports, except for the most recent one that just don't, the, the most, I forget which, which one, uh, maybe it was about a year ago, I don't have my book in front of me, but, but I was like commending it, which is at the very end, it begins to address what societies can do to minimize a harm that is going to take a lot longer to fix in that moment. In other words, if we're always talking about the past, oh, we, fuck, we screwed up, sorry for the French, or the future, we need to build more resilient, you're not giving people present time. So a lot of these sort of gloom and doom reports that sort of end with, unless you minimize harm by, you know, minimize carbon by 2% or 3% or whatever. Well, I can't do that as an individual, but as an individual I, I, yeah. or as mayor, I can do something. Okay. okay. Yes, please. David. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I'm all, I'm, I'm supportive of, significant spending on adaptation. I think that's really important. We know that we're going to be living in a hotter world full yeah. of more climate impacts. We, we need to focus on that, not just on the mitigation side. But I, Ted, I would take issue with your, and Julia too, with your description of, the, of, the, um, of alarm as, as producing fatalism inevitably. And I would just look back on the last few years and say, um, you, I think you and I have slightly different views of um, the value of climate activism, but I see an enormous global climate awakening, um, much bigger than anything we've seen before, that has reshaped the priorities of the global ruling class. I don't think there's really any doubt about that. Now, whether that has moved us in precisely the right directions or at precisely the right speed is up for debate. There are probably other counterfactuals to consider, but when I think back in the last few years, I think we now have, if what we're really trying to do is move, um, move the needle, um, we have a global political um, environment in which climate is a much higher priority um, than it was five years ago, 
And that is, for a number of reasons, but a growing political alarm is one of those factors. Can, can I just interrogate that for one yeah. second? Yeah, you because know, you just wrote a column uh, about uh, like, uh, like BlackRock, literally like Larry Fink, you know, ESG, we are going to see, you know, everyone goes and makes their, their phony net zero commitments. And then, like, you know, kind of shit goes south a little bit, and suddenly they're all like, yeah, never mind about that, and we're just back to shareholder value. Um, so, um, like, like I, it just feels fake to me, David. It just feels like um, part of this, like, and we get, you know, we've had this now, this discourse, this anti-doomism from, you know, a lot of folks, some of them in this room, going, like, stop with the doom, don't be so fatalistic, you know. But the complaint about the doomism is not that, the kind of perceived sort of catastrophist risk is just completely unhinged from like yeah. anything physically yeah. that can happen in the world. It's that you're giving up. Well, if this is your analysis of the actual risk, giving up is not an unreasonable, you know, kind of going to doom and fatalism is not an unreasonable response. Um, so, uh, you know, I just, I would just would ask like, like you just wrote so, the column about how like, the people, the, the global ruling class that supposedly changed, you know, flipped, just flipped back, you know, without hardly blinking I mean, it, an yeah, eye. That's such a binary way of thinking. Yeah. But yes, obviously, most yeah, of these yeah, commitments yeah, are yeah. still yeah. quite empty, for sure. Um, but there yeah, were... I mean, yeah, TJ. <laughs> yeah, TJ. Yeah, I, I think, you know, we are talking of two different worlds. Yeah. Yeah, I see a world, and a lot of us here in this part of uh, the globe, uh, I think, uh, I, you know, fair to say we agree on this. We see a wholly unequal world. And I think that's not factoring into the discussion at all. What is this we we are talking about? There is agency is uh, vastly disproportionate across the world. Yeah. And what scares me about dealing with climate is not that guys you know, yeah, I'm not even so scared of the deniers anymore. You know, they just marginalized. And they have become a sort of straw people to hit at. But I am afraid of the John Kerry's of the world, who goes to Africa and he tells them, good, you don't need any fossil fuel investment. Whatever you need can be done with renewables. We are going to have to take time to get off gas and oil. And oops, we have the Ukraine war, so we are even going to go back to coal. But all you guys out there are not going to be able to use any of it. So get your act together and up with your renewables. This is the discourse that scares the shit out of me. Okay. That's, that's the point I want to drive to. So I want to come. Know, if, we, if we were able to grasp this, if we were able to say that this is a world with differentiated, I hate to say this, but this is foundational to the UNFCC, the Climate Convention, and is the best thing we did there to talk of a world with common but differentiated responsibility. Let us put our minds to it a little bit. And I really appeal to American civil society, US civil society, that does not think about it hard enough. And maybe we can make progress. Thank you. Thank you, TJ. I'm, I'm going to actually, um, so your gesture was slightly obscure to me. Um, OK, I will come to that question in a moment. I was just going to tell people that um, I'm going to let this run. Um, I'm going to impose a Nordhaus tax um, and let this run for an extra seven minutes or so. Um, but, uh, and uh, that, that's obviously to you out, out there in Cyberland as well. And before we come to that question, I just want to come back to Ted and um, Juliet <coughs> on the question. Is it your view that the IPC, is it your view either that the IPCC should in some ways tailor what it says about the science of climate change to effective messaging so that people don't feel mm -hmm. discouraged? Or is it alternatively possibly your view that the IPCC is already engaged in a corrupt op operation which deliberately maximizes um, the catastrophism? Because I I, those no. were the two options that I seem to be getting there. So, mm -hmm. Juliet, you're, you're shaking your head. So that's good. No, 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 not, not the latter at all. 
I mean, look, we're, we learned over time. And so, so if, if, you know, to David's point, you know, at, at one stage it was really hard to talk about response, you know, sort of response mitigation, that I'm gonna measure success as fewer people dying in a, in a climate catastrophe. That, that will be success when it comes to climate change because we, all, the, all the political focus had to be on mitigation because if you take your eyes off mitigation, then you're, you're, you're giving up, right? I think over time, you realize that's a really silly way to discuss this. We're clearly you know, too late. There's, there's so much going on. So what I'm saying is and there, there, that we should do another rethink about how we're engaging communities and to TJ's important point, different communities, both within the United States and outside of the United States that, are, um, that have a capacity to not just adapt in large, in, in large ways, people shouldn't live here anymore. People should should uh, 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 you know, move away from certain areas by by seizures. But also in in that moment of you know whether it's preparedness or all the stuff that I think about in terms of cas you know all the terminology people like me use like cascading losses and stupid deaths and all that stuff. So that's what I'm saying is that this is now a time in which we've got the past, which is mitigation. We've got the future, which is all the things that we want to do to get renewables out there and think about different jurisdictions. But like, let's spend a little bit of time talking about now, like right now, like it's the, you know, and, it, it's, it's recurring. And conscious of TJ's point, when you say we there, who do you yeah. mean? Who is it that has I, to I do this? We in terms of people who are trying to change the global climate change dialogue, right? So the UN, right, for example, or uh, or local and state or federal governments, right? The, most of the stuff that I talk about is being going to be done on the local level anyway. Right. So, that, so you're, when, when you yeah. say we, you mean local government people. Yeah, Ted. I think it's right. And individuals and... I, I, I mean, we kind of go to say it's corrupt is, is I, I think, not how I would frame it. I, no. I would just say there are multiple perverse incentives to sort of overhype the risk. Um, and I think to some yeah. of the earlier conversations we've had here, I, I'm not, I don't think there's any we or anyone who could actually decide exactly not to. Um, and, and, and that's, um, you know, you get these institutions um, and you get these, um, and, and what we've been talking about is how hard it is to kind of, these emergent phenomena, how hard it is, even in the di discursively, how hard it is to change it. So, you know, I, I just end up back at um, what we were talking about at dinner last night that Nils Gilman, our longtime collaborator here, raised years ago, which is we need better elites. And I'm not sure what exactly that means in the context of IPCC reports, uh, but we need to do better. I think it means that, you know, be the better elite you want to see. I think yes. that's what. Um, <laughs> question at the back there that's going to be the last question. Halkett. I'm 10 years old and oh. I'd like to ask this question for the whole panel. What can my generation do to help the climate? What can people born in the last 10 years, what can they do to help our climate in our world? Okay, I'm going to take that. That's a great question to end with. Um, you have a future as a, as a moderator. Is that what I do? Um, I'm going to go backwards around the panel to this. So, Juliet. Oh, I mean, I, I, I have three kids too. This is the issue of your. This is the issue that gets them enraged and 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 activated. So whether it is, uh, 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 well, I guess I'll end with this. How I just ended the last one, which is, don't minimize the influence you can have at the local level on this. We tend to think global or national, and U.S. presidents and John Kerry said, like there's a lot that you could do even now on the local level in terms of engagement, education, response, whatever else. So uh, it starts at home. Great. David. Um, well, I think the most important thing is to prioritize this um, challenge in all of, it, in all of the um, facets that it represents, which is to say, both on the mitigation and on the adaptation side, to take seriously that um, the sort of um, the fundamental basis, the physical basis of our lives is changing and we need to respond and to make sure that those who are older than us uh, you know, and more powerful than us are taking those challenges seriously. It's a, political, it's a political answer as much as an individual action answer. Is that, I'm just thinking having not been a 10 year old for some time, is that, um, does that really, I mean, 
<laughs> that seemed to me to be a, a, a to be a point slightly of powerlessness. If you if you're saying, well, you just have to grow up and do the politics. Um, uh, well, I just I think in general, the the more cultural attention that's paid to this um, subject, the better. So I think that you know that starts at the conversational level. It grows up to you know through genuine politics and and activism. But it it's not exclusively that. It's just a matter of um, f focusing attention, especially. Um, among those around you. Ted. Less doom, depression, and fatalism, more imagination, uh, creativity, uh, innovation. Um, and um, so again, you're saying, imagine a better, you're saying yeah. to this generation, imagine a better future. Imagine the future you want um, and go and, 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 and go, go create it. Um, and you have to so imagine it before you can create it. missing the actual power relations. And the, I mean, imagine the future you want. That's, is that really a helpful way to go? Absolutely. OK, OK. Um, I think it's where we're all uh, kind of um, uh, sort of transformation, actually, of the sort we're talking about happens um, and the idea that it's a you know that there's a pitched battle whose battle lines everybody understands and someone has to go win I, I don't actually think that's how this works okay we'll come back to your interest in winning later TJ uh, uh, I want to say uh, I want to say to my young friend you know that uh, it's very important for young people in the parts of the world where you live well, which is wonderful, and I think it should be that way. But you must understand that there is a large part of the world where young people like you, uh, boys and girls, are more scared about what will happen tomorrow or this evening than what will happen 20 years from now. So whether they get to eat, whether they will be safe, whether they will be sheltered, whether they will be able to go to school, whether they can dream, this is still very difficult for a vast majority of young people like you across the world. So. Is there, is there something that uh, you sh your generation should look for? I think the first thing your generation should look for is a fair world, a just world. I'm writing a little book on climate justice. And I think uh, there was a way I was writing it so far. But I think this question makes me feel that I want to go back and rewrite the book differently. So work for a fair world, work for a just world, then we will know how to take the problems that are before us and we will figure out how to solve them. And perhaps it will, the we that I complained about that is not real, that we can become real. So work for a fairer 